Okay, well, we are at five past now. So perhaps if we if we commence proceedings and then anyone who joins in a little bit later can um can simply catch up where we are. Um, anyway, so welcome to Digital Burns Night 3, um, which is the third event in the most recent series of Bars Digital Events, um, and the third event in its own series, really, um, being the third annual Bars Digital Burns Night now, um, which is exciting. My name's Cleo callaghan Um, I'm a PhD researcher in Scottish literature, and um, I'm on the BARS Digital Events um, Committee. I'm also one of the postgraduate representatives for BARS. Um, also from the Digital Events Committee is Professor Matthew Sankster of the University of Glasgow, who's also here this evening. Um, I'm going to pass over very shortly to um, <clears throat> our host for the evening, uh, Dr. Andrew McInnes. Um, but just a few quick notices, first of all, and a few housekeeping things. Um, as I mentioned, this event is um, three of five um, in the most recent digital event series. Um, so we do have two more forthcoming events, um, the first of which is taking place on the 9th of March. Um, that's Romantic Portraits and Their Afterlives. And then after that, um, uh, concluding the series is the Pandemic and Romantic Pedagogy in Asia. And that's towards the end of April, um, and it will take place at a slightly earlier time than usual due to disparate time zones. Um, so two things to look forward to there. Um, Format-wise, I think Burns Night always takes a slightly different um, format to other digital events, I think. But um, broadly speaking, um, the speakers will speak, and then we can have questions or audience engagement um, towards the end, I think, but Andy can maybe confirm. Um, and as usual, if you have a question and you want to put it in the chat at any point, we'll come to that later. Um, if you put a capital Q at the beginning, that does help identify it more quickly, but if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, cameras often mics muted um, whilst speakers are speaking um, is helpful. And then obviously turn on your camera um, at the end if you would like. Um, I think that covers everything. So I will now introduce our host for the evening, um, who is Dr. Andrew McInnes, um, who is Reader in Romanticisms and co-director of EHU 19, the 19th Century Research Centre at Edge Hill University. He continues to work on the Romantic Ridiculous, which is an AHRC ECR Leadership Fellow project funded 2020 to 2022. Um, he's also published widely on Romantic Period women's writing, Gothic fiction and children's literature. Um, and he also, of course, um, organized the enormous, in size and enormously successful um, Bars NASA Joint Conference at Ed Edge Hill University um, last summer, which was a wonderful few days. Um, and I'm sure many of you there were there as well. So passing over to Andy. Thank you, Andy, and um, enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Cleo. Um, at, it's at this point that I always forget that I've um, that I'm supposed to introduce people, and I have I, I, I have absolutely no formal introduction. So I'm going to apologise to my wonderful um, speakers in a moment. Uh, but I'll talk you through the format of the evening. Uh, then I'll cobble together some introductions with apologies, uh, and then I'll we'll pass over to them. You're absolutely welcome to like put a cue in the chat and ask questions. Uh, but one of the sort of motivations behind the evening is, is to sort of really sort of celebrate uh, Robert Burns and um, maybe share in um, sort of poetry reading. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm going for P for poetry reading over Q for questions, uh, essentially. So the, this event follows a traditional Burns night, which sounds very formal, but as you can possibly tell already, it's not going to be a, a horrendously um, formal event. The, a traditional Burns night uh, begins with an immortal memory, and Kirstein is going to give uh, that in a moment. Uh, it is then followed by a, a range of toasts. Uh, we have uh, an address to the lassies that Paul is going to give, and then a reply to the laddies um, that Zainab is going to give. And one of the um, drives behind all of the Burns Night, but particularly this one, is a sort of celebratory evening of poetry, uh, whiskey. I'm going to do a, a, an example of what that is. Whiskey. I've already charged my um, bumper for uh, for toasts um, and um, song. I'm, I'm definitely hoping for song. Um, so I, um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kirstine in a minute. 
uh, I invited her uh, because she was a, one of our keynote speakers at um, New Romanticisms, uh, and it was a sort of wonderful um, talk. Uh, and it, there, there, there were songs involved, and like now we're now now we're like we're, we're friends, Kirstine, and that that that's how I'm that's how I'm introducing you. My friend Kirstine is going to do the immortal memory. Over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I just want to check everybody can hear me loud and clear. That all good. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we are friends, Andy. We are friends. Um, and it was an amazing conference. And thank you again for the, the opportunity to, to, to take part in that. It was really, it was a really uh, fantastic event. And, uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming along this evening um, just to celebrate Burns. So <clears throat> thanks to the team. I have just a few minutes. Normally, an immortal memory is about 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes in some of these interminable burn suppers, it can be even longer than that. Um, but I have considerably shorter, so I'm not going to waste any time. Um, and I'm also not going to give you anything that is remotely scholarly. This is a bit of a personal uh, stomp, fast and furious stomp around Burns. Um, I do also want to sing this evening, but if I sing a song as part of the Immortal Memory, it takes up two or three minutes. So I might suggest that uh, I could maybe do that as a party piece afterwards. And I want to deal with Burns uh, this evening in the Immortal Memory under four brief headings, which uh, resonate with Burns today, the 2nd of February, 2023. So I'm gonna have four headings and uh, look at Burns's relevance to us at this particular moment. At least I hope that's uh, how it's all going to pan out. So I wanted to start with the topic of health and well-being. In his all too short life, Burns is born in 1759 and dies in 1796. Um, he didn't experience, thank goodness for him, a pandemic like we've had. But to start on a bit of a sombre note, he did sadly experience the deaths of many of his loved ones, including several of his own children. The first set of twins born to him and the lady who was to be his long-term wife, Jean Armour, died. His daughter Elizabeth died just the year before Burns himself. Uh, he had by that time lost his younger brother William, aged only 13 in 1790. And of course, most poignantly of all, he misses out entirely on the life of his final son, Maxwell, who's born uh, on the day of Burns's funeral in 1796, July 1796. This pattern is probably not at all unusual for someone of Burns's social standing in the last years of the 18th century. I think we can all say that we've come a long way in terms of rates of infant survival. But after the couple of years we've all been experiencing, we're in a place of thinking a wee bit differently about death, about quality of our lives and our, the quality of our inevitable deaths. Burns did experience considerable personal ill health. Um, he had some respiratory issues that kind of uh, you know, bogged him down at times, not helped by him having trained as a flax dresser in Irvine in the early 1780s as a really young man. And his personal and thus creative life, um, it, are, are both of them are singularly uh, punctuated with regular periods of depression or melancholy what he himself referred to as his blue devils. Um, and my young colleague, Dr. Moira Hansen, has recently shown in her, in her PhD that Burns was most probably hypomanic. Working in higher education, uh, uh, or just actually dealing with daily life in 2023, our mental health and well-being has never been so important. And Burns's story and the poetry and prose arising from these experiences have never been so relevant, I think. Alan Cumming and Stephen Hoggett's 2022 National Theatre of Scotland production, Burn, indeed focused on this very issue. Burns's A Winter Night, appropriate choice of poem for this evening, uh, was one of his first attempts at the Pindaric Ode. And it's a poem that you can definitely identify with the dark depths of winter storms and their accompanying moods in the West of Scotland in 2023. It opens, with a very brief quotation from King Lear about the defence we need to have from seasons like these. And Burns begins. When biting Boreas fell and dour, sharp shivers through the leafless bower. When Phoebus gies a short-lived glower far south the lift, dim darkening through the flaky shower of whirling drift. A night, the storm the steeples rocked, Poor labour, sweet and sleep, was locked. 
while burns with snowy reefs up choked wild eddying swirl or through the mining outlet balked down headlong hurl. A lovely play on the name Burns himself with the Scots word for stream, of course, which he describes with this word balked, which means vomited downwards. So there's this, well, we had a night like that actually on Tuesday night here. Uh, no sickness ensued, no vomiting uh, was experienced. But the darkness of this year's winter, I think my colleagues and friends around the screen uh, from the west of Scotland will certainly tell you it's been a very dark and dismal winter, quite hard to thaw. So that's our first theme, health and well-being. Theme number two, climate crisis. In November 2021, COP26 came to Glasgow. The world indeed came to Glasgow. And the shocking reality of our human impact on the environment on our planet was all too clear to see and feel. If the early 21st century is a time of tremendous upheaval in terms of our natural world, sitting on the brink of short to medium term disaster, then Burns would undoubtedly have been a spokesperson for it as he was in his own time. One of his very first songs, we're pretty sure he was only 16 when he wrote it, demonstrates an acute sense of understanding and empathy with the national, natural world. This is his song composed in August, better known as Westland Winds, um, actually kind of often named as uh, people's favourite Burns, favourite Burns poem. And it's the one that starts, is set now frequently sung to a much more recent tune than the one, one Burns chose. It's the one that starts, Now westland winds and slaughtering guns bring autumn's pleasant weather. And Burns explains and describes um, the landscape with all the species around him with the kind of high, highlight, the sort of climax of the, the song being, Thus every kind their pleasure find, the savage and the tender. Some social join and leagues combine, some solitary wander. Avaunt away the cruel sway, tyrannic man's dominion. The sportsman's joy, the murdering cry the fluttering gory pinion. The anti-lobbying, uh, the anti, the anti -lobbying, <laughs> I'll, I'll try that again, the anti-hunting lobby even, might pounce on Westland Winds as a bit of an anthem. But what Burns is really doing in this beautiful lyric is telling us of the diversity of the natural world around us if we just stop and look. And he's telling us about our abilities as human beings to disrespect and manhandle our natural resources. And as my friend and many of your friend, friend to many of you, Nigel Leask has just recently commented in a wonderful paper on burns and the environment that he gave in Glasgow just last week, there are some nine species of bird mentioned in Westland Winds. Stopping and tacking heed uh, at the Scots for noticing uh, the details is really central to Burns's work as a poet. In a, in a much less well-known lyric called The Posy, which is one of the songs uh, set to music in George Thompson's collection of songs, the protagonist of the song sets out to pull a little posy of wild flowers together for the girl he loves. The primrose and the pink as the first flowers of spring. The rose like a balmy kiss or sweet bonnie moo. The hyacinth for constancy with, with, it, with, with its unchanging blue the lily pure and fair, and the daisy for simplicity and unaffected air. The hawthorn with its lock so siller grey, where like an aged man it stands at break o' day. Such a fabulous description of the, 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 the hawthorn overhung with blossom. The woodbine when the evening star is near, and the violet for modesty. And he ties these all together with a silken band of love for his ain dear me. Perhaps you might think a rather sentimental wee song, and indeed it is in the best of ways, but it's also a record of the wildflower year around him and of the stories of each of these flowers, the myths or symbols which display a human interaction which, with each of these species across time. Appreciation, respect and care for the balance and cycles of the natural world. OK, 
Okay, topic number three, our uh, daily political shambles. I'm a Radio 4 listener, getting increasingly fed up with listening to the news, but often finding myself tuning into newscast as an alternative, uh, nicely satirical view. And if one characteristic is prevalent for Burns, it's calling out hypocrisy, especially in leadership, be that spiritual or political leadership. So in our moment, he would have another kind of field day, I think. One of my favourite of all Burns' longer poems is one of the opening pieces in the, his first published collection in 1786. It's a poem called The Trois Dugs, which many of you may, may know. And we can see in this poem that not a lot has changed in 200 years. Burns' narrator, this is for those of you who don't know this poem, uh, in this long narrative poem, one of Burns' long narrative poems, stumbles upon two dogs who are pals and recounts to us the conversations they're having about their lives and their masters. The first is the mighty impressive Caesar who belongs to a landed master. He has a bra brass collar and he's Nano Scotland's dugs. He's actually in Newfoundland, we find out. But he, what we do know is that he's a dog of high degree. His doggy pal is the lovable Lewis, named after one of Burns' own most favourite dogs, and also after James McPherson, of course, uh, uh, from Ossian. And it, I was going to say, if I if I had time, I would if I had time, I would read this. But actually, I am going to read this description of Lewis because it's one of my favourite of all bits of Burns. Uh, so bear with me, even if I overrun Andy. So this is the description of Lewis the collie. <clears throat> the tether was a plumeman's collie, a rhyming, ranting, raving billy. Qua for his friend and comrade had him and in his freak had Lewis caught him. After some dog and heel and sang was made lang sign, Lord knows how lang. He was a gash and face for tyke, as ever lap a shuch or dyke. His honest, Sonsy, bonds at face, I gat him friends in ilka place. His breast was white, his towsy back wheel clad with coat o' glossy black. His gauzy tail we upward curl, hung out his herdies we a swirl. I just love that description. I can see the dog, I can see him moving, I can see his personality just by that fabulous description in Scots. These dogs are equals. Uh, when they're playing or urinating on the hills. But they begin a rather serious conversation when Caesar asks Lewis what it's really like to be a ploughman's collie. Is it not just horrible hard work and no play? Lewis explains that it is, but he also paints a picture of love and friendship, of loyalty in difficult circumstances. And he paints a picture of all the lovely things about being part of a family of decent, honest, fonset folk respectable people. He believes that these people are working, of course, for some gentle master sitting in Parliament to improve everybody's status and for the nation's good. Caesar quickly explains to Lewis that he's got the wrong end of the stick altogether. Haste, lad, ye little ken about it. For Britain's good, good faith, I doot it. Say rather, gone as premiers lead him, and saying I or knows they bid him. At operas and plays parading, mortgages, gambling, masquerading, or maybe in a frolic daft to Hague or Calais takes a waft to make a tour and tack a whirl, to learn bon ton and see the whirl. And after a quick uh, description of the grand tour that Burns then gives, uh, Caesar concludes, for Britain's good, for her destruction with dissipation, feud and faction. This is when I pause and say, in the words of just one of our recent leaders, remind you of anybody? I could go on, uh, but frankly, we're all sickened, fed up hearing about Downing Street's shenanigans. Burns concludes the Twa Dogs with a wonderful observation that the sun is set, the dogs realise their time together is up. They shat they shake their ears or lugs, the Scots word for ears, and rejoice that they were no men, but dugs. Such a lack of equality is central to Burns's moment in time. It's even more important to us in 2023. And this need of balance is prevalent elsewhere 
in Burns's work in his humanitarian anthem, A Man's a Man. In another early work, A Ballad, Man Was Made to Mourn, which is the poem that got me into Burns at the age of 16 when I was becoming aware of politics and was horrified at man's inhumanity to man. I'm not even going to talk about Ukraine tonight, but I could easily uh, feature that and show how Burns is relevant and what he says is relevant to that situation. But I want to come on to my final topic, which is controversy. One of the reasons, at least in my view, as to why Burns has retained his place as one of the greatest of all poets is that he has an innate ability to capture and express human emotion from so many different perspectives. It's a plus. Um, but of course, controversy and rule breaking followed him around from the early days of philandering, poetically tracked by his Tarbolton poems, his bragging of fornication, the rowdiness of his parties and his nearly always male socialising. There are boisterous drinking songs, there are naughty 18 rated body songs, some highly erotic, some celebrating beautifully the joys of sexual freedom and some not always respect, respectful of their subjects. There's certainly some uncomfortable reading in Burns's letters where he brags of his sexual prowess to his close male friends in terms highly unacceptable then and especially now. And for every one of these examples, there are of course balancing moments which show us Burns's fine conduct, his loyalty, his honesty, and his principled views on behalf of those who have no voice at the table. Again, Burns shows himself to be a fine platform for engaging with contemporary discussions around gender and power, around misogyny, around issues of sexual freedom and expression that are so central to public debate in 2023. As a literary critic, it's my job neither to condone Burns nor to explain him as a human being. It's my job to look at the artist and his artistic creations, his writing in all its various guises and to situate those in his moment and within all our experiences as human beings. And I can honestly say that after some 30 years of working with Burns, I am still learning new things every time I pick up my trusty tattered copy of Burns's poems and songs. Every time I sing a song, recite a poem, or dig deeply into the technical intricacies of these with students, yes, Burns is flawed and controversial like nearly all fine artists, but he is eternally fascinating. And today I've got the great privilege of working with a young team uh, at Glasgow Centre for Robert Burns Studies, bringing Burns's text into the 21st century, which with as much of this supporting context to make him as central to this century as he has been for the last two. And you'll have gathered by now, I think, that Burns is standing up quite well to this attention and scrutiny and deconstruction. And on a personal note, having been essential to uh, Burns having been central to a male dominated and male focused work. I'm one of three senior women academics and we have had at least another three female postdoctorates who've been working with us in our team at the center. And that is something that is new and bringing new perspectives to to study of Burns and his work. There's loads more I could say, but my time is absolutely up. So it's my lovely job now to ask you to raise your glass or mug or whatever you've got. I have my favourite tipple, which is Isla's Ardbeg single malt whiskey. Uh, and I would ask you to raise your glass and toast this evening the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Tarabi. Thank you guys for listening. To Rabbi, thank you so much, Kirstine. That was a wonderful um, talk, uh, uh, sort of like personal, but also literary critical. And you sang, even though you said that you weren't going to sing. It was um, fantastic. So that, what a brilliant um, way of starting us off and and giving that immortal memory and sort of really thinking about the, the, the sort of the immortality of, of, of the memory. So it was wonderful. Um, thank you. My... Uh, next speaker uh, is a, a Twitter friend um, who I haven't met in uh, in real life. So this is sort of continues our sort of uh, virtual relationship, uh, Paul. Uh, but I invited you because um, because of your recent poetry collection, uh, Poem Ecosse, which I think we're going to hear a little bit uh, of tonight. Apologies for my terrible pronunciation of it. Um, 
but you've also recently this is me cobbling together my sort of semi-formal introduction you've also like just published a a, a book on robert burns uh, and um the, the sort of uh and and cultural me memory uh cultural politics so the sort of what a, what a fantastic occasion um to sort of have you um speaking to, speaking to us um on on burns as a sort of as a literary expert and a sort of creative um a creative writer so uh welcome paul and over to you thanks so much andrew thanks for your invite and uh also thanks to kirstine for our beautiful thoughtful and momentous as well uh immortal memory good evening everyone um so i would like to well actually start by sharing my slides with you just to just so that you can follow the, the the two main poems that i've decided to focus this this toast on can we all see this correctly yeah um so yes i'd like to focus this toast on two poems uh both staging someone who is arguably the most famous lassie queen and the queen in scottish history the French Mary Queen of Scots. Both poems are set in the castle of Fotheringay, where after a failed attempt at overthrowing her cousin Elizabeth I, Mary awaited her execution. The first poem which I'll introduce is by Burns, of course. It is his Lament for Mary Queen of Scots, written in 1790. And the second poem that I'd like to read you is called Fotheringay, and it features in my debut poetry collection of Franco-Scottish verse, published earlier this year, in which Andrew mentioned. Before I jumped into the poems, at, at this point, I think I should also probably mention that there's quite a bit of research that has been led at the University of Glasgow on the memorialization of Mary Queen of Scots. And I think both the poems I'm going to read talk also to that long history of Mary Queen of Scots afterlife and, and memory. Um, there's an exhibition at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow on that very topic, which finishes on Sunday. So if you're in Scotland, you still have a few days to, to and, and it's, if you haven't gone, well, yeah, here's a, a recommendation for you. Uh, I believe there was also a symposium on that topic just a few days ago. So yes, uh, a topical topic indeed. Uh, back to the poems now. So the first one by Burns, I'd like to say a few words to introduce it first because uh, it's a very interesting poem. It can be read as part of the intense revival of Mary's memory in 18th century Scotland, when after the Jacobite rebellions, uh, pro-Union historians such as David Hume or William Robertson quarreled with the more patriotic James and Gilbert Stuart about the historical significance as well as virtue of the unfortunate queen. Yet more specifically, I think this poem also tells us an important story about Burns' own shifting politics. Because indeed, the Lament of Mary Queen of Scots was written in 1790, one year after the storming of the Bastille in France, and definitely the, the turning point in Burns' political uh, life. Until that date, Burns' wrestle with radical, popular Presbyterians in Ayrshire, the kind of people that he mocked in Holy Willie's Prayer or, or the Holy Fair. Well, this, this wrestle had led him closer, actually, to the liberal but also middle-class wing of Scotland's Kirk, also known as the Scottish New Licht. This movement, very influential in Masonic circles, was paradoxical. On the one hand, it was more open-minded and ecumenical, but on the other, it was elitist, wary of the more democratic John Knox style of Presbyterianism uh, that was popular in Scotland and especially in Ayrshire. So as such, the New Licht movement was potentially compatible with a sentimental kind of Jacobite Toryism, being both sympathetic to the liberal theology of Anglicans and Catholics, while well, keen on royalist social hierarchies. And certainly in the late 1780s, just before the French Revolution, Burns flirted with such notions. And yet, as Kirsten has beautifully explained, as a, as a peasant poet, 
Burns's acute class consciousness could also turn him into a keen receiver of French revolutionary ideas, especially when those combine a critique of religious fanaticism with patriotic and egalitarian views. Burns did not address the French Revolution in his writing until 1792, but we know that France was on his mind as early as 1789, the day of the uh, Bastille Day, um, because we know from his correspondence that Burns ordered books from La Fontaine, Molière, Racine, Corneille, and Voltaire between 1789 and 1790, and nowhere else in Burns's correspondence um, can we find such traces of, of literary Francophilia. He had learned French when he was a boy, but it's only around that time, interestingly, exactly at the time when the French Revolution started, that Burns got really into French literature. Uh, so in other words, Burns had both French and France on his mind when writing about the Franco-Scottish Queen Mary, a traditional Jacobite royalist subject, but with a new Jacobin and democratic context. So that was just a little blurb for you before I read the poem, which I will do now. Uh, so politically significant, I think, but also as you're going to see a, a, color, a colorful bit of romance. So the lament of Mary Queen of Scots on the return of spring. Now nature hangs her mantle green on every blooming tree and spreads her sheets so daisy white out o'er the grassy lea. Now Phoebus cheers the crystal streams and glads the azure skies, but nocht can glad the weary wight that fast endurance lies. Now laverocks wake the merry morn aloft on dewy wing, the male in his noontide bower makes woodland echoes ring. The mavis wild with monia note sings drowsy day to rest. In love and freedom they rejoice with care nor thrall oppressed. Now blooms the lily by the bank, the primrose doon the bray, the hawthorn's budding in the glen and milk white as the sleigh. The meanest hind in fair Scotland may rove the sweet samang, but I, the queen of Scotland, mon lie in presence trang. I was the queen of bony France, where happy I have been. Who lightly raise I in the morn as blithely do not e'en, and I'm the sovereign of Scotland and mon your traitor there, yet here I lie in foreign bands and never ending care. But as for thee, thou false woman, my sister and my fay, grim vengeance yet shall wet a sword that through thy soul shall gay. The weeping blood in woman's breast was never known to thee, nor the balm that draps on wounds of woe for a woman's pitying e. My son, my son, may kin kinder star upon thy fortune shine, and may those pleasures guile thy reign that ne'er would blank on mine. God keep thee frae thy mother's fay, or turn their hearts to thee, and where thou meest thy mother's friend, remember him to me. O oh, soon to me may summer suns ne mare light up the morn, ne mare to me the autumn winds wave o'er the yellow corn, and in the narrow house of death let winter round me rave, and the next flowers that deck the spring bloom on my peaceful grave. So here is the here was the poem, and as an echo to or answer to Burns. I'd like to end by reading a piece now that I wrote as part of my Poems Écossais, um, a collection that came out in July and which blends my native French tongue uh, with my acquired uh, Scots language. And Mary Stuart is of course a key figure in this linguistic experiment. And I dedicated a whole section of the book to her. So as a compliment to the kind of Jacobin and Jacobite politics lurking in Burns's poem, and perhaps a little bit in my book too, admittedly, uh, I thought it'd be appropriate to end with a bit of Franco-Scottish bilingualism. Of course, the poem I'm about to read is a, is a modern, joyously anachronistic take on Mary Stuart's medieval brogue, but I suppose that had to be my personal way as a Franco-Scot to interact with her complicated legacy. 
So like Burns, my poem is set in Fotheringay in the castle, actually on the day of the execution of, of, of Mary Stuart. And it is written in our imagined, modernized, I suppose, French, Scottish voice. I'll read it now. Fotheringay, 8 February 1587, Mary Stuart on the scaffold. Au revoir, for fortune, fancy, and far espoir. Au revoir, ye barren, malagroused, cri de coeur. Au revoir, sein, drich, defect, forso, and fright. Drap by drap, the burn of madwam, outran the bed that I swam. Au revoir, rose ith, on berry and blois, sir Clyde. Au revoir, Kelbride en Provence, and tour upon Tweed. Au revoir, ye sonsy marshes of dreamdoms, dear. Cloud by cloud, yon lift a boon loss, it lift to kiss on my cross. Au revoir, ye rockle heim, where I thought I could. Au revoir, ye trockled heed that ain't again should. And adieu, oh, muckle hurt that forever would. Blade by blade, the edge of my bliss blossoms atween thistle and liss. So on this note, blending the memories of Robert Barnes and Mary Stewart, I'll invite you to raise a toast to the lasses of Scotland and everywhere in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. And uh, another sort of a lovely way to bring sort of Robert Burns and Mary Queen of Scots sort of right up into 2023. Um, sort of like a fantastic, like sort of, yeah, collision between uh, modernity and the past. Like, uh, so sort of a wonderful way of, of continuing from Kirstein's um, themes. Um, fantastic. Um, so that was a, a toast to, uh, to, the, um, to the lassies uh, and Zadeb, um my friend who works with me at Edgehill University uh, is 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 going to do the uh, reply um, to to the laddies and um, is also a, a returning speaker with with, with uh, Burns Night. So Burns Night one, um, Zainab uh, read a poem and she's been sort of upgraded to a a, a toaster uh, by Burns Night three, which could be subtitled uh, "Return or Perhaps Revenge of Zainab." Thanks, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello everybody, thank you very much to everybody at BARS for inviting me this evening. Um, I feel like a bit of an interloper because I'm not a romanticist, um, but yeah, I'm delighted to be here and it's been fascinating so far to listen to you, Kirsty, Christine and, and Paul. Um, yeah. Yeah, completely fascinating. Um, yeah, I'll get on with it. Andy's told me that I've got um, about seven minutes or thereabouts to talk. So I'm going to use them up in praise of listening and listeners. So I'm going to begin by inviting you to listen to an extract from a radio programme called The South Wind Blows, that's broadcast on the Irish channel RTE1 on Sunday nights. One of the first poems I ever wrote was about listening to it. I'm not gonna read the poem this evening because as I say, it was one of the first poems that I ever wrote, but it was called 3 a.m., No Hope of Sleep. And it was about listening to the programme on my laptop in the small hours of the morning. And like it, it's about how it made my laptop seem like a bird's beak, like a glowing beak and like a bird that was singing. And as you listen to the programme, you could follow this bird as it flew around, bringing voices that were calling through the music from all around the world into my ears. And I was living in Kuwait when I discovered the South Wind Blows, the radio programme. And as you know, Kuwait is such a hot, dry place. But when I listened to the programme, I'd have the feeling more often than not that I was somehow sheltering from a wild coastal storm or sometimes I'd be on the sea battling it all lashed about. Um, and it's because of how the host 
Philip King always starts the programme. He usually begins by speaking in Irish. And I'm not really sure what he says. I think it's welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I've, I've tried to find out what it is. I think that's what it is. Um, I kind of enjoy that I don't understand completely what he says. I can just enjoy the music of it. Um, and then he moves on to say in English, often says that he's broadcasting from the most southerly tip of the Dingle Peninsula, right on the west coast of Ireland. And then he'll tell us what the weather's like there. And more often than not, it's wet and windy and the programme's broadcast at night. So it's nearly always dark. I used to think about how his voice and the music he shared on the programme collapsed the distance between us. I was thousands of miles away from Dingle in Kuwait. Actually, I looked up the distance in miles this afternoon from Ireland to Kuwait. Google says it's 4,143.7 miles via the A3. <laughs> so uh, yeah, anyway, so I was thousands of miles away from, from Dingle in Kuwait, but the voices on the programme called me across the distance and in the act of listening, I was with them, I was very close. So the extract I'm inviting you to listen to, will make sense in a minute, is Philip King's introduction and then part of the first song that he plays from the programme that was broadcast this year on the 22nd of January. The first song is from Eddie Reader. She's singing, my love is like a red, red rose. And as you know, there's a distance of 10,000 mile to collapse in that poem. When I heard it the other day, it reminded me of how I first listened to the programme and the distances I travelled with it and the closeness that I experienced to the music and the voices in it. So I'm going to play not all of the first song, it's about three minutes. I'm going to play about a minute and a half so that you hear like the, the one iteration of the ballad. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and share my sound and play. Well, according to the air, fault as far as I've stuck it in Clore. Hello there, everybody. You're very welcome to West Kerry, and you're very welcome to the South Wind Blows. My love is like a red, red rose. It's newly sprung in June. My heart is like a melody that sweetly plays its tune. again yeah yes yeah <laughs> okay yeah so that's the first bit of eddie reader singing the ballad and then on the radio program um philip king goes on to uh quote what eddie reader says about that song her relationship to the poem and the song and to robert burns himself i thought it was really interesting i'm going to play it to you now so i'm going to share my screen again um just need to find the correct section uh 
Great. The beautiful. Just take it back a tiny bit. Um, so I'm going to share again. And you're just going to hear the tiny little bit of the end of her singing. And then Philip, Quing, Philip King talking about what Eddie Reader says about her relationship to the song. The beautiful voice of Eddie Reader and Eddie was singing the Robbie Burns poem, My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Back in 2003, Eddie fell in love with Robbie Burns and she says, I sang my love is like a red, red rose to a bunch of worse for the drink people in a bar in Glasgow one cold January night. And I felt something happened between me and the words and the people listening, something profoundly moving. After all my travels, singing songs to people, I recognised this as being a vein of emotional gold as yet unmined. I began to be spooked by him and started on a journey to find him. Robert, the guy from Ayrshire that I would have drunk with, walked with, talked with and probably got into trouble with. I wanted to show him off to everyone, sit folk down and say, no, no, listen, listen, really listen listen to this. So Eddie Reader getting us We're back on again. You are, you are. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of stopped me in my tracks when I was, when I thought about uh, Eddie Reader saying that, when she mentioned that she felt something happen, she said, I felt something happen between me and the words and the people listening, something profoundly moving. I was thinking about that something because when I'm writing and when I'm reading, I'm always trying to find out. There's something between me and the words and the people listening when I'm writing, or if I'm reading, it's something, or if I'm the person that's listening, something happens between me and the words and the person speaking. And I'm always trying to find out what it is. I don't know what it is. I was thinking that when I write a poem, I don't ever really expect anyone to listen. And it's profoundly moving when someone does. And what about reading a poem or hearing a poem? What about listening to one? Eddie Reader says, when she really began to listen to Burns' poems, she began to be spooked by him as if he was with her, her friend, her drinking companion, her partner in crime. Um, I was invited to write about listening and calling for a project called Dial a Poem that was set up by the writer poet Sarah Jackson at Nottingham Trent University. And it was inspired by the original Dial a Poem project that was set up in New York in 1968 by John Giorno. And the idea was that it was a public poetry service. So you went to a phone booth, dialed a number, listened to a poem. The contemporary version that I contributed to is a phone app. So you download the app, then you use a directory to find the number of the poem that you want to listen to. You dial it on your phone. The app offers you like a little rotary dial and then you listen. You listen across any distance and the poem comes right into your ears. It really makes you pay attention to the act of listening. So the poem of mine that I'm going to read is on the Dialer Poem app. It's called The Woodcutter's Children, and it's about people using their phones like Hansel and Gretel used breadcrumbs and pebbles. To be honest, when I wrote it, I didn't really know what it was about beyond the act of phoning. But as I listen to it now, and because of just having Eddie Reader in my mind, um, and because of having some distance from it, I hear that it's about something wider. It's about calling and longing and calling across distances and really hoping that someone will listen. It's also been about being spooked when you're not sure who is listening. I can hear a lot of things in it now, actually, and I can see where it came to me from. Um, 
It was initially from reading about refugees at Calais and how phones are vital to them. The only way to stay in contact with home, a kind of trail of breadcrumbs that keeps the way back open. Um, yeah, and I'd sort of forgotten that I'd written it until I heard Eddie Reader on the radio the other day singing My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose, and then saying how she really wanted people to listen and, and what listening to Robert Burns' poetry meant to her. What she said reminded me what a moving and spooky thing it is when voices connect across those distances on phones, or radio broadcasts, or I was just thinking of it before when I was listening to Kirstine singing and um, Paul reading his poems. It made me think that without that connection, our voices are orphaned. It made me think that what happens when someone listens, really listens, why it's so profoundly moving, like Eddie Reader says, um, is because it's something like finding your way back home. So after saying so much about this poem that I'm about to read, I feel that I have to say I really hate it when people go on about their poems before they read them. Um, I feel like the poems just want to speak for themselves. Um, and I feel like this is a, a bit of a ramble, but this experience has really made me, thinking about this poem, thinking about uh, Eddie Reader speaking about her experience of listening to and singing Robert Burns' poetry um, has really made me realise what it means to me to have a listener or listen, listeners. Um, without them, my voice is orphaned. And it seems to me that when you listen to me, to my poems, um, I have a way of finding my way back home. So here is the poem. Um, I'm just gonna move it across to another screen. So this poem is called The Woodcutter's Children. Um, when you see it written out, there's no punctuation. It's like, it's kind of a breathless run across the page, which is um, set up in landscape orientation. The Woodcutter's Children. There is moonlight back to where we began. We run between the trees. We must be glinting, we light. On the pebbles, we hold them to our ears. We call softly, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you there? If the pebble won't hear, we drop it light on another no time. Can you imagine? We fall on them like hawks on mice. We hold them to our ears. We call softly, are you there? Are you there? Please answer, it's like, it's like we're falling into our own ears. It's like there is a connection. Where are you? Do you know? Do you know? We look around, but we can't tell. It's a forest. There are pebbles on the ground. They look like moons. Can you find us? Can you come? If you can hear me, it's like, can you come? If you can hear me, it's like an echo. It's like a stutter on the line. It's like we hold the pebbles to our ears. We breathe. Come quick. We breathe. Come quick. We can hear ears. We can hear ears prick up up there in the branches. So there's my poem, and I would like to raise a toast to the laddies and to all the listeners. Thank you, Zainab. That was profoundly moving. <laughs> Or perhaps that's just me. Um, what we've got to now, we've finished our um, toasts and we've got um, half an hour left, I think, for anyone to share their um, poems. So or they, they can read. Uh, you can ask a question if you wish of anyone. Uh, but the idea of Burns and I always at this point, I think, is to listen to each other, uh, as Zadab was, has, has sort of introduced to us, but also to... Um, to sort of read uh, poetry. It can be Burns poetry, it can be our own poetry. Uh, it can be a poem that has moved you or a poem that you wish to share. I have like a set of poems um, available. Um, if, there, if there are no takers, um, I, will, I will inflict poetry upon you. 
um that sounds harsh to poetry i think but uh, there, there, there's there's that to do so we can sort of you could sort of uh put a p into the the chat rather than a q you can raise your hand um we could have kirstine's promised us two to three minutes of singing uh, even though she sang in her, in her immortal memory, and um, Paul and Zainab would be welcome to uh, read um, further poems. If we have no immediate takers, I have a poem um, picked out that I thought about um, reading. It's not a Burns poem; it's a Coleridge poem. That was the first book I um, I held uh, up, and it's um, it's it's a it's not a famous. I don't think it's a famous um, Coleridge poem, and I'm hoping I did. Ha I haven't read it on one of the previous um, digital Burns nights, but I, if if I have, um, I'm repeating myself, uh, and I apologise. Um, but I'm going to read it to you now, uh, as there are no immediate um, volunteers, and hopefully my um, my my own my my poetry reading w it w will be so amateurish it will um, open the floodgates to allow other people to read. Um, this is a poem called Metrical Feet, Lesson for a Boy uh, by Coleridge, and it has a it has a lot of diacritics on it, which I, I, I suspect I'm supposed to understand and be able to read um, according to accordingly how um, Coleridge wants it. But I'm hoping he's just done the poet. He's done the poetry enough that he, his meaning will come across. Uh, the beginning of it is is a, is teaching um, Derwin, his son, uh, about a poetic feet metrical feet uh which i have to admit i'm very bad at as a um, literary critic um and i'm just i'm i'm trusting in coleridge that uh, me reading it out according to his lines will will give a sense of um his meaning but it it ends i think um very movingly uh so that's what i'm going to try and um do so metrical feet lesson for a boy Trochy trips from long to short, from long to long in solemn sort. Slow, spondy, stalk, strong foot, yet ill able, ever to come up with dactyl, trisyllable. Iambics march from short to long, with a leap and a bound, that the swift anapest strong. One syllable long, with one short at each side. Amphibrachis hastes with a stately stride. First and last being long, middle, short, Amphimesa strikes his thundering hoofs like a proud high-bred racer. If Derwent be innocent, steady and wise, and delight in the things of the earth, of earth, water and skies, tender warmth for his heart with these metres to show it, with sound sense in his brains may make Derwent a poet. May crown him with fame and must win him with love, of his father on earth and his father above. My dear, dear child, could you stand upon Skidore, you would not from its whole ridge see, see a man who loves you as your fond ST Coleridge. So that's my that that's my choice of poem uh, and ST Coleridge to his son Derwent. And um, I just think it ends uh, wonderfully. And I apologize if I um, destroyed his metrical feet at the beginning. But I open the floor to um, to you as uh, potential poetry readers. And we'll, we'll and we'll turn to our speakers for for an extra um, uh, an extra poem if necessary, or a song, a song, Kirsteen, a song. Sure, I can do a song if you want. Um, while everybody finds a a poem. Uh, actually, I thought I might sing Red Rose, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I will now. Actually, if we've already heard heard a version of it, I was I was. Well, you could do your own one. Like Zayn was saying, do 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 uh, do uh, your I love it's like a red red rose. Yeah. The reason I, I want to do it actually is because very few people sing the the lyric to the tune that Burns wrote the song for. So Eddie Reader is singing there the tune. It's a beautiful tune. It's also an 18th century tune. It's a really gorgeous tune. Um, an 18th century fiddle tune called Low Down in the Broom is the song, is the tune that she sings. And that's the, that is the most popular tune to be sung with this song. So I heard, you know, I knew, I learned it first with uh, Low Down in the Broom. Um, but my father was a singer and um, he often sang this to the original tune that Burns wrote it for, which is a Straspe, a fiddle tune called Major Graham's Straspe by Neil Gow, the famous 18th century fiddler who Burns met on his Highland tour and was a great fan of Gow. And actually, I've got a wee bit of a, a, a thesis that uh, there was something a bit special about Gow's tunes for 
burns because he does do something quite special with them and it's a very stately tune and it puts the because it's quite a stately dance the Strasby it's a wee bit it's a it's a folk dance but it's got a kind of classical uh, it's got fancy footwork and it's a bit kind of classical um so and I think it really suits the the slightly yeah the kind of slightly stately images that Burns uses here you know which which critics now see he kind of pinched from lots of other places I, I don't I don't think it matters that he pinched them from other places I think it's the way he puts it all together that makes it so good so this is Major Graham Strasby so it's just to let you hear the different tune for the words yeah okay <clears throat> I hope it sounds all right with the Zoom because Zoom's not great for music, but anyway. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny love, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas can dry, till all the seas can dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, and I will love thee still. My dear, while the sands o' oh, life shall run, and fare thee will, my only love, and fare thee will a while, and I will come again, my love. Lord, where? Ten thousand miles. So it kind of just puts the emphasis on the different words. It's it's my love rather than my love. Um, and I think it makes a big difference. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> oh, that was fabulous. I think that was exactly the right um song to sing. And it was so it was so nice to hear the difference from the Eddie Reader. Yeah, both beautiful tunes. They are. They're really both beautiful tunes. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, that was fabulous. Now that 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 raises the stakes uh, rather for for someone to sort of read another poem or to or, or to perform another piece. But is there is there anyone that wants to? Paul, would you like to read another of your poems? Uh, Putting you on the spot. Well, I, I think I'm going to hide behind uh, a tribute to someone. Actually. Uh, <laughs> But also, thanks so much, Kirstine. That was just beautiful. It's great to hear that lesser known version of the song was just, just as, I don't know, most enthusing and, and heartbreaking, I suppose, just incredible. Uh, so thanks, Kirstine, for that. And what I'd like to read, actually, I was trying to think quite quickly uh, about a poem about Barnes by someone else and maybe more contemporary. And I thought perhaps be a good opportunity now that for me that the whole PhD and book sequence is, is, is ending to do a little tribute to my co-supervisor, uh, Robert Crawford, a uh, uh, very distinguished uh, Scottish poet and uh, incredible supervisor as well, um, and, uh, and a very keen knower of, of, of Barnes and, and biographer of Barnes. And I'd like to read you a, um, maybe a, a small short-ish poem of, of, of his, um, which he published in A Scottish Assembly, which is probably his, probably his, his, his most famous book of poetry from, from 1990, uh, right in the devolution debate at the time. Uh, but th this one is not too political, really. It's more, it's more a little snippet, a little, um, yeah, a, a little picture, a little moment in, in, in Burns's life. It, it's called the, the Dal's Wing, Dal's Winton Enlightenment, and it kind of explores a little bit Burns's friendship to Patrick Miller, who was one of the those genius and Enlightenment creators that lived in Dumfries uh, at the time. I, th I think Robert is very interested in the idea of universal ideas and universal progress even being invented in uh, 
in, in the periphery. So in, in, in the small town of Dumfries where Barnes was, where Patrick Miller is friend, the inventor of uh, iron, iron vessels and, and almost early steamboats uh, was based. And there's also a mention of Alexander Naismith, who was the painter that painted the, the most famous iconic um, portrait of Robert Barnes. And I quite like the way it ends. Uh, so I'm going to read that now. Um, the Dalles went in enlightenment. Patrick Miller's first iron vessel, the world's first steamship, is swanning across Dalswinton Loch. A landscape painter, Alexander Naismith, perches on deck beside his good friend, Robert Barnes. It's a calm, clear morning. The painter will later invent the compression rivet and work out the actual arrangement between propeller and engine. The poet will write about the light of science dawning over Europe, remembering how cold sun struck Pat's boat that October day at Dalswinton, when the churning paddles articulated the loch in triumphant meter, and the locals made some cracks, almost as if they were watching a ship of fools. There it is. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Paul. That was fabulous. Um, I've had uh, I've had a direct message from um, Matt. Um, thanks to uh, offering an, a ridiculous poem, so I'm going to put him on the spot and ask him, invite him to to give his McGonagall. Yeah, I was looking. I was looking for people who've written poems of tribute to Burns, and there's a rather inoffensive Lucy Hemans one, another rather inoffensive Letitia London one. There is also uh, one by Scotland's other greatest poet, William Topaz McGonagall of Silvery. Tay fame. Um, I have never seen this poem until I googled it just now, so I will read it very badly, but that I think is entirely in keeping with the McGonagall aesthetic, so I will give this a go. Immortal Robert Burns of Air, there's but a few poets can with you compare. Some of your poems and songs are very fine, so Mary in Heaven is most sublime, and then again in your cotter's Saturday night, your genius there does shine most bright, as pure as the dewdrops of night. Your well, Tamashenta is very fine, both funny, racy, and divine. From John O'Groats to Dumfries, or critics consider it to be a masterpiece. And you, you have, oh, you have said the same. Therefore, they are not to blame. And in my own opinion, both you and they are right, for your genius there does sparkle bright, which I most solemnly declare to the immortal bard of air. Your Banks and Braes of Bonnie Doon is sweet and melodious in, its, melodious in its tune, and the poetry is moral and sublime. My opinion, nothing can be more fine. Your Scots where hay with Wallace bled is most beautiful to hear sung or read, for your genius there does shine as bright like unto the stars of night. Immortal bard of air, I must conclude my muse, to speak in praise of thee does not refuse. For you are a mighty poet, few could with you compare, and also an honour to Scotland, for your genius it is rare. That was fantastic. Thank you. I think uh, like uh, an evening without a McGonagall tribute to Burns is not a, it, it is not a proper Burns night. That's what I'm going to say from now on. That was great. I don't think I've I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Fantastic. Uh, is is anyone else want to um, give us a poem? It can be your own. It can be somebody else's. It can be a tribute to Burns. It can be non Burns related. Speak now or forever hold your peace. I would suggest if if there are no takers, I think we could we 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 could sort of edge towards um, thinking about having a um, uh, thinking towards a burn supper. So a traditional burn supper would would, would you know you'd have your haggis, your leeks and tappies. You probably you may you might start with some um, a cockalicky soup. You'd end with um, cranachan, which is like raspberries and cream uh, mixed with whiskey. Uh, it's, uh, I, I highly recommend searching out a, a traditional burn supper. That's the the supper part of the evening is is one that we don't have. I have a I I could end with a couple of poems. Uh, my, my first one is I, I finally remember to bring the um, the Selkirk Grace, which I think should, should start a Burns um, night. This is from this is a nineteen seventies ish um, I guess um, key um, bowl that I, 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 I took from my grand's house um, after she died. 
Um, and the Selkirk Grace, if you don't know it, and I apologise for my very poor um, Scottish, given my Scottish heritage, is some hay meat and can he eat, and some would eat that want it, but we have meat and we can eat, so let the thought Lord be thank it. And that would sort of begin a, uh, uh, that burn supper part of the um, meal. I could I, I can I could do the first um paragraph again in my very poor Scottish um of ode to to a haggis and I used to I used to know all of it but I'm not sure if I could do all of it um impromptu but that's a that's a sort of lovely uh, a lovely poem to sort of send you away into the, the into the evening off I, I I would say so that's um the the, the first stanza at least goes um, so, oh no, I was going to do I was going to do the Selkirk Grace, uh, Grace again. No, it is fair for your honest sonsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race. A boon the more you take your place, paint tripe or fam. Will you worthy of the grace as langs my am? And I used to know the grace as langs my am, but that's the sort of beginning, um, the 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 opening stanza of Ode to a Haggis. Um, and I think on that note, uh, thank you for listening. Um, and thank you to our speakers for such a sort of wonderful, personal uh, and, and, and moving um, presentations with sort of song and poetry at, at the heart. It was a sort of it was a really lovely evening and it was a really lovely evening because of you all. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Andy. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> Have a lovely evening, everybody. I've, yeah. I've drained my um I've drained my glass, but like a, a final toast to Burns and to you all and to friendship and to listening. Slander, everyone. Slander. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, and everyone. That was really wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Thank Lee. You.